Hello, everyone. Um, we were just waiting for a couple of minutes to allow more people to join, but I think they are joining as we speak. Uh, so I would like to uh, kick off now, if that's okay. Um, so welcome, everybody, to this really exciting talk, um, uh, our Camp on Fire, which is a really exciting title for today's discussion um, area, uh, which is around the climate crisis and its effect on um, refugees and, and the people who suffer most, really. Um, I would like to start with some introductions. Firstly, introduce myself. Um, I am Ahmed Masoud. I am a Palestinian writer and director uh, who grew up in the Gaza Strip in, in Palestine. I'm currently living in London. I've moved here back in 2002, and I've been living here since then. But I go back very often because all my family are in Gaza. I've got today with me an exciting um, a list of panelists who will speak to you about their experience and about their um, knowledge and, and research on the effect of climate uh, crisis on, on refugees. Um, these are Zeyna Agha, um, who is an, a Palestinian Iraqi poet um, and who has done a lot of work and research. She's got a massive bio, by the way, um, a really exciting work that she's done uh, before, um, including being a uh, uh, on a Shabaka, and her writing has appeared in uh, the New York Times, amongst many others. I've also got uh, with me here today Hamza Hamushi, um, uh, who is a, a Nigerian researcher based in London. Um, he's currently in North Africa, and he's speaking to us uh, from there, and he's done uh, numerous work on um, research in, on Africa and um, established um, the African, what is it, um, Hamza, was the African um, uh, Food Program. He's a coordinator for the North Africa Food Sover Sovereignty uh, Network, which um, he will talk to us a little bit more about, about it. And last but not least, we have another presenter who is not with us today, but we will play his presentation as a video um, in a bit. Um, his name is Mohammed Suleiman Labat, who is um, an artist based in Samara refugee camp in Algeria. Um, unfortunately, he can't be with us in person because of uh, power outage. He currently doesn't have any electricity at the moment, but we've recorded his talk and we'll play it to you later on. So what I'd like to do is just to start with a bit of introduction, kick off the conversation. This is a really relaxed kind of uh, session in here, a discussion point. Um, and I would like to thank the Liverpool Arabic Arts Festival at, for putting it on in collaboration with Creative Destructions as well. Um, again, I'm, I'm chairing this event because it's really kind of close to my heart. Um, when I was approached and asked to do it, I thought, wow, what a, a wonderful subject, because I've been thinking about this subject for a long time. Uh, and I've had many conversations with people um, about the effect of climate crisis on our community, on our society, um, and what is happening to our world right now. However, most of those discussions and conversations have always been kind of focused and concentrated uh, on the kind of, Western discourse of this uh, crisis. Uh, very often, the climate crisis discourse is Western dominated somehow. It's, it's about what's happening in the UK or France or Europe or the US, etc. But there are there is very little talk about um, what is happening uh, to people in parts of the world where they're really suffering as a result of the climate crisis. And on top of that, they're going through very difficult circumstances um, because of conflict, uh, because of political unrest, because of difficult economies, etc. Uh, so it's really exciting to be able to engage with this um, conversation right now. One of the things that um, sort of struck me uh, maybe a couple of years when the kind of debate on climate change and the climate crisis was kind of happening was a meme that was kind of circulated on social media of uh, Greta Thunberg um, on a train somewhere in Africa. Somebody obviously photoshopped it and edited it. And, 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 and as you look through the window while she's sitting on the train, there are a couple of kids from Africa 
running, trying to catch up with that train with kind of two vessels of water. They're trying to fill the water in there. And it touched my heart, to be honest with you, because I thought, actually, we should be talking about them more than Greta, for example. I'm not undermining all of her work. I think it's been incredible and amazing. And I've had this debate a lot uh, with people about that, that we don't talk enough about those communities that are affected uh, enough. I am from uh, Gaza, as I said, and um, I'm from Palestine. And, and, and the situation there is really pretty bad from a climate change perspective. And on top of that, we have the occupation, the Israeli occupation, where a lot uh, of the time um, olive trees are being cut and uprooted um, across the West Bank, which is really uh, disastrous for the environment in, in general. Um, cutting trees generally is seen as a kind of a direct cause of climate change. Um, we do this around the world because of economies, because of industry, because of capitalism, whatever you want to call it. But to do it because of occupation and colonialism is just something really disheartening, to be honest with you, and, and no one talks about that. Um, very often in, in uh, the Gaza Strip as well, the Israelis just open sewage water and flood the farmland and many natural habitats just die as a result of this act of just opening uh, um, sewage water uh, in there. The, the sea itself in Gaza is really ruined with sewage water as well that kind of opens up from the Israeli side, but also from the Palestinian side, because there's nowhere else for that sewage water to, to go. Um, so that's just an example of really the dire situation that um, many communities suffer um, under this um, important uh, issue that we need to talk about. Um, but I think this is enough from me around my introduction. I would like to uh, start by handing over to our presenters. Um, and I'd like Zaina first to just uh, introduce herself and talk to you a little bit for about five minutes about her work, um, particularly in reference to this subject. So over to you, Zaina. Sure, thank you, Ahmed, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I should open just by saying that I'm slightly worried I have internet issues, so if for whatever reason I do, please just flag it and I'll do some lateral thinking um, about how to resolve it. Um, so yes, as, as Ahmed said, um, I'm a writer and policy analyst and poet, um, and I've looked at uh, the issue of climate change and uh, discriminatory climate practices and limitations to uh, adaptive capabilities in the Palestine context. Um, I'm Palestinian Iraqi, um, but raised in the UK. Um, and so I've been always very interested in the way in which uh, you know, climate change or climate breakdown leads to displacement, leads to immigration, and then leads to these societal issues, which, you know, uh, drive so much of contemporary discourse and contemporary politics. Um, I thought what actually um, might be nice uh, or helpful, I don't know, um, is to uh, read a poem out um, and then perhaps answer some of the questions, more perhaps practical questions um, around climate change, uh, which I've spent more of my academic side looking at, um, perhaps in the in the chat, um, you know, after these short presentations. Um, but I'm going to open with a poem uh, called Borderland, which I wrote um, the first time I went through um, Ben Gurion Airport as a Palestinian. Um, and uh, yeah, name, father's name, grandfather's name. You have curly hair. If I had a sister, I think she could look something like you. Where are you from? Tiberius. Oh, you're from here. Your question drips with violence. No, sister, if I were from here, I would not be interrogated by you. If I were from here, I would not be a security threat. If I am from here, why were we moved from here? If I am from here, why can't I live here? And if I am from here, why has it taken me 23 years to get back? Your colleague, my cousin, asks me where I was going. The territories? She looks through my phone, reads my emails, checks my contacts. She takes my cousin's name and his number. He is Iraqi, and so is his area code. 
but he is a refugee in Fortress Europe now. He wrestled the purple sea to sit silent. She's also pretty, long hair, a blue jumper. Behind her, Bibi sits proud, half smiling at my homecoming, and the flag, clumsily large in my celebratory cell, hangs limp and flaccid. Have you participated in any protests? Do you know anyone here? Their name, numbers. Have you been to Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan? When did you delete your Facebook? What are you studying? What courses are you taking? Do you speak Arabic? Why do you have an Arabic keyboard? Because my mother wanted me to learn the language of my ancestors. And Darwish taught me that land is inherited like language. And my sister says I'm from here. So please excuse my literacy. Do you keep any blogs? Can you show it to me? No, it's gone. She has pretty eyes too, dark like mine. I mirror her in my head. Why did you want to interrogate travelers? What was the army like? Have you ever been in love? Where is your grandfather from? Is he from here? Have you ever been to Tiberias? Is it nice? Although I am from here, I cannot answer. Show me your blog. No, it's gone. Are you being sincere with me right now? Her head cocked sideways and I paused. What a weird word. Sincerity implies authenticity, honesty and respectability. No, and neither are you. This is a game and we are well matched. You can send me back home to my grey sky and imperial island, but my sister said I'm from here and your questions degrade my homecoming. So please be reasonable. Be sincere. Winning is not entry and losing is not denial. Winning is staying free, staying beloved. You cannot intimidate me scare me. You can detain me, search me, question me, but my skull is made of stronger stuff. And if you'd ask my grandmother, I think we may... Mean... I'd have told you Khazna. It means that my skull is her treasury, her palace lineage. You cannot win against us. Oh, it said I paused slightly. I'm just going to pick up again. Hopefully that'll be fine. So <laughs> I, I suppose I am your security threat. <laughs> Sorry, Fala. <laughs> oh God, my mum needs to get off EE, they're the worst network. <laughs> um, so syllable identity negates your falsity and my family blasts your rewritten history. I exist. And as long as I breathe your air, this sort Soil will nurture me. My sister said, um, I'll leave it there and, and I'd love to talk more about the, the technicalities of climate change in Palestine uh, in the QA, but um, I just thought I'd open with that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zaina. Yeah, um, sorry about the um, uh, sort of connections. I think, I think, yeah, something technical is happening over there. Um, but it's a beautiful poem. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. It really kind of goes to the heart of what we're talking about around the issue of displacement, uh, which I will ask you about in, in a minute. But before I do that, I want to hand over to Hamza. Um, and I want to apologize to him because I mispronounced his name earlier. I said Hamushi, but it's Hamushin. I'm so sorry, Hamza, for this uh, mistake. Um, but yeah, over to you, please, to tell us more about your research and your work in this area, please. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Sam Saud. Uh, Ahmed. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here to, sh to be sharing the panel with you and with Zaina. It's a shame that our Sahrawi brother couldn't make it today, uh, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll watch his video later on. Um, so my name is Hamza Hamushan, actually, not Hamushin, uh, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, I'm Algerian. Uh, actually, I'm talking to you from London right now. Uh, I'm a researcher and activist. Um, I founded an organization called Environmental Justice North Africa. And I was a co-founder as well for the North African Network for Food Sovereignty. Currently, I work as the North Africa Program Coordinator for the Transnational Institute that is based in Amsterdam. Um, my areas of work vary, but I'll, I'll try to focus on the question of climate, climate change or climate justice overall, and try to share some reflections around this. My reflections would be 
less creative than those of Zaina. Uh, thanks, Zaina, for sharing this strong um, poem with us. And hopefully we can we can go to the nitty gritty of displacement and refugees later on. But um, the thing that I want to share with, with all of you is um, I started thinking about those questions when I was working with um, a London-based NGO called Platform. I worked with them around specifically the oil and gas industry, um, especially um, around my home country, Algeria. So we were looking at Britain's attempt to grab more gas um, from Algeria. And this particular piece of work led me um, to connect with other environmental and climate struggles all over the world, especially around um, the environmental and human rights abuses of the oil and gas industry um, in the global south. So a few years later, we, um, I co-edited a book around climate justice that was presented in Tunis at the World Social Forum. And that piece of work helped me to connect the dots um, between various issues. So I started doing, conducting field research in Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco around environmental struggles. And that led, led me to, um, to realize something very important, that we cannot just talk about climate justice or climate change without connecting it to social justice without connecting it to economic justice, without connecting it to questions of sovereignty um, over economic systems, over natural resources, and that would touch on questions uh, of colonialism, as Ahmed mentioned at the start. Um, so for me, I started um, uh, reformulating or kind of reframing the questions of climate change or climate justice, at least in the North African context, in terms of um, a just development, um, moving away from uh, reliance or dependency on extractivist sectors that have been imposed on those countries since colonial times. Um, so it's very important the way we talk about climate change and how do we address it? Like the narrative around it, the words, the concepts we use. Because climate justice uh, in Arabic, sometimes is confusing. People do not get it when you say climate justice, what do you mean? But the principles, the ideas of climate justice are very important because we are talking about how do we repair the systems that generated those inequalities, that generated the climate catastrophes that people are living through right now. We are talking about the historical responsibility of the industrialized West in generating this crisis. We are talking about the differential vulnerabilities of dealing with climate change. Um, so it happens that most of the impacts right now are taking place in the global South where vulnerable communities are facing those impacts. So climate justice is a way to say, we need to deal with these impacts in a just way. So the industrialized West must pay a climate debt for these communities, for these countries. Climate change is already a reality. It's not, it's, we're, it's not in the future, it is happening right now. Um, the catastrophe is happening right now. And it is taking place in, in regions like North Africa or the, Arab, or the Arab world in general. So just recently um, in July, Algeria, my home country suffered from catastrophic wildfires that caused economic damage and fatalities. Around 100 people died from those wildfires. And these are a, cons a consequence of climate change. But how do we deal with this kind of stuff? This is the questions that we need to put at the heart of climate justice. And in here, we need to decolonize the, the systems we live through. We need to democratize the system we live through. And we need to listen to the communities. Um, in relation to the questions of displacement um, and refugees, um, 
a lot of you know discussions have been uh, ha have been made around the question of climate refugees. I don't like that that term specifically because it's really hard to say that refugees are just you know uh, migrating or moving because just for climate because of climate change. It is much more complex than that. Uh, I think it's it's multiple factors. It's economic factors, political factors, and also environmental and climate factors. But how do we deal with that climate crisis? People will be on the move. Uh, there was um, a report lately by the World Bank talking about you know, climate displacement. And they said that most people, most displaced people for, from climate change impacts would, be take, would happen within countries or within regions, rather than people flooding Europe as some you know, climate fascists, because there is this discourse right now in the North saying, okay, climate change is happening. So now they recognize that climate change is happening after decades of denialism. And now they are using that narrative to say, okay, we need to militarize our borders. So our response needs to be, like they are saying, we need to securitize. We, 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 don't, we need to not let those people come you know, to fortress Europe. And we need to challenge that discourse. Um, uh, climate justice means not militarization. It means not securitization. It means letting people to move. Um, this should be a right. Letting people to move, to stay, and to go back. So these are, these are the final final words of, of my introduction. So I'm looking forward to, to more discussion. Thank you, Hamza. I mean, lots of important points in here that uh, I would love to pick up on. Um, I think it will take us a couple of hours really to discuss all of those rather than just uh, this hour. Um, uh, but, but really, I, I think the point around militarizing borders it, I think we're seeing it happening right now, you know, so much so that, you know, it's becoming very hard for people to move across. Again, as you said, not just because of the climate change, but for so many other reasons. Um, but climate change for me, the way I see it, is, is at, the heart of, at the heart of it um, all the time. But we'll come back to that. And thank you so much for, for this uh, talk. Um, I'm going to move on now to play a video by Mohammed Suleiman Labat, who, as, as I said earlier, couldn't be with us because of the power outage in the, in the Samara refugee camp where he is right now. I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction about Mohammed and, and his work so you know him a little bit better before he start, we, we put on the, the video. So Mohammed is a Sahrawi um, artist, a Sahrawi is it's the Arabic word for somebody from the desert, um, based in the Samara refugee camp in southwest Algeria. Um, he runs an art studio, which is a very creative, small art studio called Motif Art Studio, uh, which is a space, a space of creation and experimentation. And, and the interesting bit is that he built that out of discarded materials collected from uh, the Samara camp. So a really exciting space and I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about it. Um, he's been uh, doing a lot of collaborative work across um, the world um, and, and more recently he's been doing a research, artistic research project in Helsinki in Finland called Fos Feti um, uh, with uh, Finnish artist Pekka Niskamen. Um, so a lot of exciting stuff that he's been doing but also really looking at um, the refugees and their work and really trying to un introduce sustainability within a very, very harsh environment, which is kind of really what we're looking at for in this subject. So I think without further ado, I'm just going to play the video now, um, just so for him to talk to you directly. My name is Mohamed Sleeman. Um, I'm an artist from the Sahrawi refugee camps. I was born here in these camps. Um, these camps have been um, established um, um, over 40 years ago in Algeria, uh, following um, a war that broke out in Western Sahara between the Sahrawi and uh, Morocco um, in the 70s. Um, and um, I was born in these refugee camps when my parents met here. Um, and um, life in the refugee camps is um, 
um, a day-to-day -day, um, challenge, if, uh, a series of challenges of uh, um, living here, finding um, food and uh, uh, learning and um, uh, connecting, but there's a strong um, social community here. Um, and um, as an artist, um, I would like to explore um, ways and means to respond to the situation here um, in my camps and uh, raise awareness about the story of my people. Um, and um, I, I think um, for us as people of the desert, the Sahrawi are people of the desert, literally. Um, I think the desert is largely misrepresented. Um, the, 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 the international narrative is that this, the desert is largely an empty space. There's nothing happening there. There's no life, there's no value. And that's a huge misunderstanding to, be, to, to begin with because the desert uh, plays a, such an important role in the, in, in the world ecosystem. Um, recent data from NASA showed that um, scans of um, dusts um, arriving from the desert and traveling um, across the Atlantic Ocean and into the Amazon carrying phosphorus particles and it's fertilizing the um, Amazon rainforest. So the rainfor the, the, the Amazon forest actually depends on the desert for its survival. Um, and I think not many people understand the crucial um, uh, position and role the desert plays in our lives. So it's not just empty place. Um, and also there is life and there is culture um, and there is um, a huge um, community um, spread across the desert. And the Sahrawi are just one of those communities. But the Sahrawi have been displaced from their homeland in Western Sahara and into um, refugee camps in Algeria because of the political um, conflict there, because Morocco took over um, Western Sahara. And the, the Sahrawi um, are now living in this area and uh, disconnected from their land and disconnected from their nomadic lifestyle and practices. And um, as an artist, I, I think it's very important uh, that I address these issues, but also um, try to uh, research and revive some of the practices and understanding uh, that come from this indigenous practice and indigenous understanding of the Sahrawi, of the nomadic lifestyle and what we can learn from that. The people who live here, we are the Sahrawi and we are people of the desert. And we think it's getting extremely hot for us here. So if the people of the desert are saying it's extremely hot, the rest of the world should be alerted. Everybody should be uh, prepared because if it's, we think we know a little bit about the heat. We know a little bit how, we know, we know how the desert can be hot, but it's becoming even too hot for us. Climate change is reaching far places here in the desert with negative impacts. Uh, there's less, um, there's, less water, less, less rains every year. Um, the past four or five years, we didn't have any rain at all in the desert, but uh, we, coupled with um, some unexpected uh, uh, weather changes. And um, few, six years ago, we had huge floods um, unheard of um, in the middle of the desert. And I think uh, these issues um, are um, becoming really, really important in our lives. Um, and um, some of the uh, practices and some of the um, solutions that we're trying to develop to combat such um, challenges and respond to them is uh, this amazing uh, community of uh, small scale family gardens starting in refugee camps uh, to grow food at a, in a, in a small scale um, and the solutions and the knowledge that develop um, with these practice in order to create food in this uh, inhospitable area. It, it's, it's very hot, there's no water, and there's absolutely no soil because it's just sand. But um, there's, there's a team of amazing engineers, gardeners, farmers, artists, creative people who are thinking, and there's a small movement uh, um, putting together these um, views in some sort of interdisciplinary approach in order to come up with creative solutions. Uh, you know, um, there's a mix of um, scientific understanding. There's a mix of um, creative um, approach to it, uh, recycling materials to provide solutions for these uh, gardens. And these gardens are growing um, slowly, but trying to raise food here in the middle of the desert. And I think this is an, an amazing example that as an artist I should look at. Um, I'm, I'm a visual artist, I'm a photographer and sculptor, but um, I, I think I'm, I'm less interested nowadays in creating um, object arts and more interested in joining this movement of uh, responding to uh, pressing issues, uh, raising, um, uh, creating food for our communities, uh, 
uh, responding to the challenges, the climate challenges around us, um, uh, responding to um, you know pandemic uh, problems and challenges. Uh, this is what should what artists should be looking at. And I think it's past time that we, that um, uh, visual and traditional um, aesthetics um, have have been done for a long time. But now we need to step up. We need to push our minds and our souls and our hearts in order to think and feel and prepare ourselves for something bigger. The world from now on is more challenging and we need to prepare ourselves for it. And so um, I think it's very important that for us as artists, uh, uh, that we communicate with each other, that we respond to the challenges around us and then build up on those experiences and share them with the world. That's how we build these kind of uh, solutions um, from the ground up uh, through these movements of um, engineers and scientists and artists. We need all the voices. We need a, um, a multi voices participating um, in creating solutions that respond to challenges to our communities. That's how we see um, our um, role as artists responding to, to these. Um, and myself, I created my um, artist studio from discarded materials. Um, well, in the beginning, I didn't have any funding to do it, but then I was looking for opportunities and potential, even in the discarded materials around it, from scraps of wood. There are scraps of wood and metal and car parts that I found around in the camp, collected them, put them together, and created a space for me and for other artists to use. And um, I think uh, uh, there's, a, there's a potential and a lot of possibilities around us. We just need to slow down, um, provide ourselves, give ourselves the time, um, that that space in order to um, think and and, and re envision, re look at things in a different angle, and talk and discuss and create solution, uh, create uh, connections with other artists as well. That's uh, that's very important uh, aspect of of my art practice as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, it's a shame that he's not with us um, here uh, right now to kind of talk to him more about it and ask him more about his amazing work. It sounds incredible. There was so much in that video that uh, I found incredibly fascinating. Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know about the effect of the Sahara Desert on the Amazon forest. I mean, that's, that's definitely new to me. So it's uh, lots to, to kind of learn around in there. Um, but I think one of the things that I can pick up from there and from all the talks from the uh, panelists here is we talked a little bit about um, the idea of displacement and we use the word displacement quite a lot. I just want to ask kind of the panel, um, particularly Zaina and Hamza, around what does that word actually mean to you in, in general? Um, and how could we actually differentiate um, this displacement uh, that is resulted from climate change from a normal kind of economic displacement or political displacement. Um, so I, I don't know if Zena, you want to sort of kick off with answering that because you talked a little bit about your poem, the beautiful poem you read was about, you know, borders, checkpoints, you know, ID cards, etc. So how, what does displacement mean to you to start with? Um, I think displacement, I I actually, when I hear it, I think I respond to it in very emotional terms. I think about my own family. I think about, um, you know, the communities I grew up in, in diaspora, in exile. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm, my mother is Iraqi and my father is Palestinian and both experienced very, very acute displacements and exile on account of colonialism and um, war and a lot of corporate interest, most of which also ends up in the oil, oil and gas industry, to Hamza's point. Um, and yet, you know, I think what we're seeing, what we what we will see in the future, um, again, to what Hamza was alluding to is that you know there's this discourse of like these are refugees and these are climate refugees and these are whatever. But actually, I think if you look at the history of history of displacement writ large, why people flee their homes, it's a myriad of reasons. Um, and I think you know we're getting to a point now where where does climate change begin and where do water wars end where does um you know a lack where does not be feeling safe in your home how much of that has to do with climate change as a sort of environmental phenomenon and how much of it has to do with the political instability that it creates so i think you know that we're living in this gray area and it's going to only going to be more gray um as time moves on um with regards to what constitutes a climate change emergency and what constitutes the regular in inverted commas emergency that might create someone 
or motivate somebody to uh, to leave their home if they're dispossessed. So I think these are some of the questions which there isn't an established discourse around um, on all sides of the political spectrum. I feel like there's a there's quite a healthy amount of hypocrisy um, around these discussions. And I, I also think, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this um, a few years ago, particularly when that sort of the, the really xenophobic discourse around the migrant crisis, again, in inverted commas, was rife, was this idea that sort of, unless refugees or displaced people can in some way contribute to their adopted country, they are a drain and they are undesired, you know, that they're not desired. Mm. Um, and that cheapening of human life in that way, I mean, for me has just been, and hearing that discourse from people who are ostensibly on the left has actually been the most shocking and, and vile aspect um, mm. of, of the last decade. So I think, you know, I'm, you know, displacement, there are a myriad of legal definitions that, that come into play, but actually fundamentally for me, it just signifies someone who is no longer able to live in their home country or their home place um, and exhibits incredible bravery in being able to uproot and try and replant elsewhere um, mm -hmm. and all of the experiences that that brings. So it's not just being forced militarily speaking, it's so lots of reasons that they're, it's almost like their life is made impossible to, to kind of continue and they have to seek alternative options, which in a way makes them forced to leave, I suppose. Hamza, is there any, sorry, did you want to come back in, Zaina? No, no, <laughs> we can pick it up later. Sorry, um, Hamza, is there any sort of academic way of looking at displacement to, to, to try to differentiate it and identify that this is because of climate change directly? So if you think about a fire somewhere, you know, people leave their homes and, and go somewhere, you know, is, is there any kind of scientific academic way that we can look into that? So, so you're giving me the tough question, Ahmad. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's a tough question. No, but... To answer the question, the question, your question generally, for me, displacement, um, like it has some negative connotations, right? Um, it invokes human suffering, people forced to flee their homes um, because of various reasons, um, wars, political oppression, um, and even environmental, environmental factors like big droughts. And, and I think in the main or the mainstream or the, um, the mainstream imaginary is that we see displacement as like some refugees or some people migrating from south to north, which is not, which is not true. Most people are displaced regionally um, to neighboring countries, uh, internally displaced internally from rural to urban areas because of various various um, uh, elements, but when it comes to differentiating between, I don't know. That's why I don't like um, when they use our uh, economic migrants or something like that. I, uh, what what do you mean? People, you know, migrate or leave their homelands for various reasons, and it's really hard to differentiate and to say for which reason or what, what is the primary reason. So legally speaking, the, the term climate refugees, I, I don't think it has any legal basis yet. Some people are trying you know, to put a, forward a kind of a definition to say that climate change would play um, a role in you know, displacing people, um, but it doesn't, it's really hard to differentiate. So that's, um, that's my brief answer to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you so much i mean that's that's a really good answer it's it's an interesting debate because if there is like a legal definition it becomes a thing maybe you know climate refugees as it were would be allowed to come into europe because europe is part of climate change maybe you know, mm. so maybe it's something that needs to be looked into in, in more details um zena i'm going to come back to you with a question around the role of artists to compact um greenwashing from kind of occupying kind of colonial powers as it were. Today I read in the news that Israel um, by 2030 will have all their cars being electric. You know, there was this big news on the BBC around it <clears throat> that it's going to be the first country to have all vehicles electric, no more importing of, you know, petrol cars or fossil fuel cars, etc. Um, where do you see 
I mean, for me, I see this as a, as a propaganda, to be honest, because when I look at what Israel is doing as a colonial occupying power, yet at the same time, they promote this as a greenwashing kind of um, propaganda. Where do you see the role of artists, you as an artist and as a poet, um, to, 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 to combat that and to kind of present, to expose these, these, these uh, ideas and these propaganda? Um, I mean, I don't think artists have any, have any more responsibility than anyone else to expose a hypocrisy when it comes to this discourse. I think it's actually really dangerous, um, you know, greenwashing, as with pinkwashing, as with all other kinds of um, slight, you know, discursive slights of hands, which are used to hide and mask the reality, um, need to be called out and need to be challenged. You know, one of the most jarring aspects of working on the Palestine Israel issue is people constantly saying oh well you know Israel is so green it's so it has all of it's developed all of these cutting edge technologies it has all of these startups it has all of the whatever um, without any reference to all of the extractive policies that it has towards the Palestinian people and how much it profits in, you know uh, in from Palestinian resource whether that's water land um, you know agriculture Culture, Israel and the occupation stands to gain hugely. They're the greatest, the occupation is the greatest challenge that Palestinians face, um, both economically in terms of like lack of freedom of movement and goods and people um, politically, i.e. Palestinians not having any kind of self-determination or sovereignty um, and destabilizing the already climate vulnerable population um, in a particularly climate vulnerable region. Um, and actually what we need is resilience. We don't need Israel you know, pretending that, yes, okay, it might have more carbon neutral policies than Palestinians, but there's a reason why that's the case is that Israel hinders Palestinians from adapting, um, from developing adaptive capabilities to deal with climate change. Although Palestinians and Israelis inhabit the same physical terrain, um, you know, because of direct political decisions, Palestinians suffer disproportionately more and different Palestinians, according to where they live, suffer even more greatly than that. You know, Ahmed, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, the situation in Gaza, for instance, is infinitely worse than other parts of historic Palestine. And so I think, you know, it's important to hold this hypocrisy, um, call it call it out and hold it to account because I think otherwise what ends up happening is it, it Israel manages to have this Janus faced approach where internationally it presents itself as um, pioneering and XYZ technologies but in reality the reason why um, so much of its population is able to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change is because of theft of Palestinian land, theft of Palestinian resources and control of Palestinian bodies. And I think there needs to be some kind of clear articulation of what that, um, of, of the dire effects that that poses to um, anyone who looks for justice and climate justice. Brilliant, thank you, Zaina. And, and on the same uh, subject, Hamza, here, you talked in your introduction about, um, the kind of militarizing of border and the kind of um, sort of Europe becoming more kind of fascist around um, the climate change, the climate change fascism, I think you called it, you know, um, as sort of climate change activists, what, what do you think we should do to combat that? What, how do we sort of expose that a little bit more? That's a, a very good question. And, and this discussion is, um, I feel is a very important one because I think it's, it's important to connect the dots uh, and to have a kind of a, system, a systematic analysis, um, or I would say an anti-system analysis. Uh, so, we, so in the case of Palestine, climate justice would mean decolonization. And the same thing for the Sahrawis. Uh, if Israel is doing this to Palestinians by greed, greenwashing colonialism, Morocco is doing the same, is positioning itself as one of you know, the ch champions of renewable energy, building all these huge solar you know, panels and wind farms, but in the occupied land of Sahrawis. So it's, some people call it green colonialism. So it's the continuation of the same colonial practices of plunder, of exploitation, but just with green credentials, using renewables this time rather than oil and gas. Um, so 
Regarding, regarding your question of how to tackle climate change and when it comes to questions of you know, militarizing the borders or putting forward a kind of a security discourse around climate question. So our global leaders like to use the security narrative. We need climate security. Um, and, and when you enter that discussion, it means more spending on the military more spending on the police, more spending on patrolling borders to not letting the most vulnerable people escape in you know, different forms of oppression, either climate, environmental, or political, or economic, letting them out. So the most privileged, the, mo- the people who caused, caused that um, you know, climate crisis in the first place are safeguarding themselves, safeguarding their interests, and in here, of course, we need to make some differentiations because, you know, there are black bodies in Europe as well. There are poor people in Europe as well. So we are talking about the elites, the ruling classes, the rich, the multinationals. They are safeguarding themselves and their interests and letting out people. And we need to resist that discourse. We, we need to, for me, like personally, we need to push for an open border policy. Um, if we really care about justice, if we really care about repairing the historic injustices of colonialism and ongoing ones and neo-colonialism in, in various countries, we need to have that policy of open borders. And here, like I, before I joined um, this, this panel, I was talking with um, fellow African scholars and activists around the question of climate debt. Um, because a lot of countries in the global south do not have the finances you know, to face the climate catastrophe, to face the huge impacts of droughts, of wildfires, of you know, um, water poverty. There is a huge, you know, the impact are so huge on communities and working people. Like in Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, if you have repeated heat waves and droughts, uh, the impact would be on small scale farmers, right? Because they depend on rain. Um, and they, they are usually impacted. These countries do not have, most, at least most of those countries, do not have the means to tackle these issues. And I believe, personally, that most of that money, or at least compensation, must be coming from the most countries and multinationals respons- responsible for causing that crisis. And... So this, this is climate justice. It has, it has many elements. No to militarization, no to securitization. We need a policy of open borders to help the most vulnerable. Um, and we need the payment of climate debt um, for the most vulnerable in, in the world. Brilliant. Thank you for this brilliant answer, Hamza. Really, really um, enlightening, actually, to hear it. I just want to check to see if we have questions from, I can't see the question and answers here, but I just want to open it up to see if we have questions from uh, the audience as well. I just, I'm aware that we should be finishing in 10 minutes, but the conversation, as I said, we we need about two hours to cover this topic minimum. Um, But just wondering if there's any question from the audience. Um, So I've got one here that just comes through. Um, so you've all been involved in fighting for system change against large forces. Any tactics slash moments of success that we can learn from? Which is, I think is a good question to, for, for the audience. Any, any, any good example to, to follow? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to quickly share some thoughts. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think everything Ham just said is bang on the money. Um, I think when it comes to questions of, uh, you know, repatriation for of indigenous land and life um, and also reparation suddenly everyone who speaks of justice tends to clam up um, but he's right you know this is a question of decolonization in many of these contexts you know it's decolonization in, in turtle island and contemporary uh the you know the contemporary usa and canada it's decolonization in palestine from settler colonialism it's decolonization in Australia and all of these countries, it was decolonization in Algeria, and I would argue that's an ongoing process in Algeria. Um, You know, I think these issues are very intimately connected, and I think it takes an understanding of the being able to view the world with 
that understanding actually is what facilitates a conversation around justice because otherwise what ends up happening is you fall into these traps such as green colonialism which i think is actually a really good phrase um and others where you just perpetuate the existing cycles of inequality but with some kind of interest to preventing global collapse or civilization collapse through climate breakdown um, and that really is the only difference but it's still maintaining a system of of uh, elites and and hierarchies um in terms of you know instances where where i think there's some more success i would actually you know i'm, I'm really inspired by uh comrades in um on turtle island particularly indigenous communities who work really hard to safeguard their their you know natural ways of life um and I think, you know, what happened around Standing Rock a couple of years ago was really inspirational. You know, it was a form of global solidarity where communities, of, mostly of colour, but, but all communities, um, went to, to um, Standing Rock, to the reservation to actually, you know, defend the land and, and support um, the Indigenous community who were, who were resisting. And I think that's not something which should be should be snubbed or disregarded. I think if you think of how many forces stand in the way of that kind of global solidarity, um, moments where that breaks and you have this surge of support is actually really inspiring. Um, you know, I also just think the fact that Palestinians continue to pick their olives, they continue to, um, you know, uh, live in their indigenous and historic ways, just in terms of whether farming practices, agricultural practices, or, um, you know, how they, how Bedouins, uh, you know, continue to graze their herd and continue with their, their nomadic way of life. I think they're not big statements or showpieces, but actually that, that is a success. Every day that they are able to do that, that is a political act of resistance. And that is an example of uh, triumph over settler colonialism. The, 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 the ability to actually maintain your, your indigenous way of life in the face of such staggering odds um, is a daily form of uh, muted, but nonetheless valuable uh, success. So I think I would just like to flag those, those examples. Brilliant, thank you, Zena. Hamza, is there anything you'd like to add? Is there any example you can think of? Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of examples from all over the world. Um, Zaina mentioned some struggles from the indigenous, um, but what, what I want to emphasize that frontline front communities that are facing various kinds of injustices, including the impacts of climate change, are putting forward some alternatives, are putting forward some inspiring demands, uh, you know, are engaged in struggles that we should learn from. Um, like from, from North Africa, uh, I could give so, some examples that are, you know, ongoing uprisings, right? We've seen since the, uh, the first wave of the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring from Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, we've seen a second, another second wave, including in Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, and Iraq. Um, it, it is challenging. It is really difficult because you are pitted against uh, very strong revolutionary forces. Uh, counter-revolutionary forces, I meant to say. Um, but that hope is still alive. Tunisia right now, with all the economic difficulties that it faces, um, showed some, you know, inspiring struggles like Gemna, for example, and the oasis of Gemna at the time of the start of the uprising in 2011, that was 10 years ago, the people of the oasis took over the control of the production of dates themselves. So they did a kind of a self-management experience from below. Um, they took the control of the oasis, they distributed um, the revenues among the people, uh, they built a school. Um, of course, these are small and they need you know, to be scaled up at the national and the regional level, but I think they give some kind of hope um, that People are still resisting. People are still putting forward some kind of alternatives that we need, you know, to heed and and to learn from and to emphasize. Because in the current, you know, doom and gloom scenarios that we see all over the media, uh, despair can be can be the solution. But no, people are still are still um, are still resisting, and there is hope. Mm -hmm. 
I think also, I think it's a really good question uh, from the audience there. And I think also, in a way, it's not just our responsibility to kind of have success examples. I think there are success examples in Europe and other places as well. I think we just, what we're saying here, we need to be part of that as well. We don't need to kind of divide the discourse of climate activism as it were, so that this is European, this is what happens in there. You change some rules and policies around green energy, alternative energy, and that's it, it's done. We move on. No, actually, we need to, you need to engage more with the people who are um, affected. And we need to have more success examples like that, that, that hopefully later on, it will overcome some of those challenges we're talking about, like closed borders um, and, and you know, militarizing of, of borders uh, as well. Um, Zena, I want to ask you a little bit about that, actually, about immigration. Um, do you feel that there is enough, I mean, your poetry specifically really embraces immigration, it talks about immigration and celebrates it in a way. Do you feel there is enough in, in Europe and elsewhere that enough poetry that celebrates that? And do you think that might help a little bit in terms of the climate crisis um, and its effect on, on, on refugees and other displaced people? Um. I mean, I think, well, I, I don't know. I mean, my ideas on around the subject are constantly changing. Oh, God, sorry, I live next to train tracks and I think the a cargo train is literally, it's just chef's kiss tonight. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the discourse around immigration is always immigration, immigrants, immigrants and immigration as object and as the object of the sentence and you know the people who feel a particular way about immigration i.e the people who aren't immigrants are the ones who set the tone around it um which i think is a completely false way to look at it um i think you know i think artists for the most part are quite embracing of people's challenges and and different ways of living including those who have migrated um i don't think artists are the ones that create the hostile environment you know i think this is a kind of as Hamza was saying like this anti-systems position like that we live in systems which stigmatize and criminalize and um you know objectify uh people who migrate uh for whatever reasons no matter where they come from or how long they've been there or how well their language is or what their other identities might be be it gender class sexuality whatever um you know we have a very kind of we talk about it like a blunt instrument so I think you know I think I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer to your question, but I suspect if there was a more tolerant or understanding approach to the way that people live, including those who migrate, we'd have a more tolerant understanding of how to deal with the planet and have the courage to be able to do what is necessary to safeguard our future. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Zena. I think we have come to the end of this talk, this really exciting talk. So uh, thank you so much uh, to our speakers here live with us, uh, Zena Ara and Hamza Hamushain. I hope I pronounced it rightly this time. <laughs> um, I feel embarrassed because I'm an Arab, I speak Arabic, and it doesn't matter So apologies. Um, and also for Mohammed Sleiman Labat, um, and, and apologies that um, we couldn't uh, have him here with us live as well. And there is a video of his work and what he does, which I think we will circulate later because of, because of time. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody today who joined us today for this amazing discussion, our speakers. And again, a big thanks goes to the Liverpool Arabic Arts Festival and Creative Destructions for arranging this. And um, yeah, please, you know, follow the artist's work and the researchers and everybody and support them uh, and keep talking about the subject because it's very, very important. And whenever you're invited to talk about climate change or anything, just, just think of this and think of the people that matter. And uh, like our poet Mahmoud Darwish uh, once said, think of others, um, think of others when they're there suffering as a result of the stuff that we are discussing over here. Um, thank you all very much. I hope you have a lovely evening and I hope to see you again in any in other exciting talks as well. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.